Good morning and welcome to our next lecture on computational heat and fluid flow. So we have now seen how to solve the steady Navier-Stokes equations and even to include uh, turbulence modeling using the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes approach. Now, today, we want to look at uh, the solution of uh, the unsteady Navier-Stokes equations using an implicit method. And that is then chapter 16 on the, as we focus on implicit, finite volume methods for unsteady heat and fluid flow. And we consider now again a conservation law in integral form that we have discussed already in chapter 11. So it is then a conservation law. And since we are using the finite volume method, the starting point for that specification is always the integral form. And that is for a control volume omega, and we imagine it's always the same. We imagine we have some control volume omega with the boundary d omega. So that's the boundary. And if we have a tangent to the surface, then we can define the unit normal vector n to that tangent to the surface. And then we get, and now we have an unsteady problem, so then we have the integral over d rho phi dt, and the phi is our either uh, heat transfer variable for temperature or flow variable, it can be a, um, a part of the turbulence modeling, k, turbulent kinetic energy or dissipation rate epsilon, what you like. And then we have, apart from the time rate change of uh, this quantity, we have a convective flow over the boundary, the omega, that we describe by rho density phi times the normal velocity component, u dot n, and that is a surface integral. And on the right hand side, we have a diffusive flux that is also an integral over the uh, boundary, d omega that we describe by the diffusion coefficient gamma times the gradient of phi and that also the dot product will be outer unit normal vector n and the surface integral and we might have a source term that is a, a volume integral over some source s phi so that is our conservation law. And uh, we assume now that we have a Cartesian grid with where delta x is constant and where delta y is constant. They will be the same. So that means, and we assume that we are in 2D. So that are now our assumptions. We have 2D flow or 2D heat transfer problem. And we have a Cartesian grid. If we would think in three dimensions, we would assume that the grid spacing there is one, that we have just one to two slices in the say if x and y is in the plane in the plane of the blackboard, then z would be out and then we'd have just two slices. But the main point is that we have the form that we have been considering all the time. That is, we have the, the Cartesian grid, where we have, we just look here at the, the three by three cells to, to illustrate things. And then we assume that we have our unknown quantity phi located in 
the center of the cell. So imagine now we are discussing, for example, the, solving the energy equation. And then we have the neighbors on the east and the west. These are the, then the nodes in the center of the cells. And we have the northern and the southern cells and nodes. And what we do here, we consider our control volume that is defined by this uh, center cell. And then we have there the boundaries that we shall consider. So let us do that, let's create that. So if we have, this is then the control volume that we consider. And we have the faces then at the east, at the west, the north, and the south. So these are then our, uh, the, all these four faces then make up the, the, the boundary of the control volume. So this is our control volume omega p. And then we have learned that the finite volume discretization then yields, when we do the discretization, we have already done that for the steady part, and we do it now for the unsteady part, so the finite volume discretization then yields the following, that is then equation 2. First thing is that we shall have here now a time derivative. So then we have a time derivative here of uh, rho and our um, quantity that we want to solve, for example temperature or say uh, the mass fraction, whatever, that is then in, at the node P, which we take the time derivative of that. And in our assumption now, but it is not necessary to assume that, the row is constant, but we could also have it variable. And then we have considered then this, and now we have then essentially considered the cell average of that, and now we have to multiply by the volume of the cell P. So then we have considered the, the um, time derivative. And then we consider all the fluxes. We have the convective fluxes, and then we do that in the usual way, where we have our convective mass flux at the respective phase, or unknown at the phase, that we still have to decide on how to do that. And then we do the same thing at the west. We do it at the north and at the south. So that is then describing the convective flux over the boundary of the control volume, omega p. On the right hand side we have the diffusive flux and there we use, the already, we have already decided to use their central differencing, sorry, central finite volume method. And there we have the diffusion conductance then at the eastern phase times the difference in phi at the eastern node minus the center node. We have the contribution from the west, diffusion conductance at the west, and then we have the difference in P and in W. So we then we have the fluxes over east and west, now likewise north and south. That is then the Dn over phi north minus phi p minus the d south times phi p minus phi south. So then we have considered now the diffusive flux and then it remains the source term and for the source term we make the usual assumption that we can have a linear expression for that with a uniform part <coughs> that we call for SU, and the part that depends on the um, solution at the node P times the unknown phi P at that node. So then this is then what we get when we do the finite volume discretization using a central uh, finite volume method for the diffusive fluxes and a linear approximation for the source term. We still have to decide on the convective fluxes. So, and then we choose 
either, what we have mostly been doing, either central finite volume method or we use upwind finite volume method. We have also discussed others, but these are our favorites. <coughs> just mentioned this um, regarding the choice of the discretization of the convective fluxes. So choosing a central or upwind finite volume method for the convective fluxes For example, then we would choose for the Fe, Phi E, we would choose for the central finite volume method, Fe, and then the average, we have already here, times the Phi P plus the Phi E. So the average at the, our unknowns at the center node and the east node. That would be central, or we would use the upwind discretization. Then we would decide to take the value from phi p if f e is positive, and we would decide then to take it from phi e if f e is negative, because these f e and f plus are then defined to be the value they have, for example this, if it's positive and it's negative, the Fe, then the Fe plus is zero. This is the other way around. And so on. So that we have trained, so we know how to do that. And we can also do that here. And then we get the form that we are used to. And that is then the following. That we get we have still not decided on the time derivative uh, here, that will come later, but we have now decided on those. <coughs> and when we have done that, we can define all the coefficients. So we keep the time derivative of rho, our unknown, at node p. So that is that, times the volume of the cell p. And then we get coefficients that are related to the node P. For the steady case, we call that AP. Now, you shall see in a minute, we call this here now AP tilde times phi P. And on the right hand side, we have the sum <coughs> over the neighboring of the neighbors with the neighboring coefficients and the unknowns at the neighbors. So the neighboring coefficients are then regarding, in that case, East, West, North, South. So that is just the same as we did for the steady case because the discretization here is just the same for the convective and diffusive fluxes and for the source term as we had for steady case. And we will have here the uniform part of the source term. And the coefficients are then so where the neighboring coefficients are the same as for the steady um, convection diffusion equation. For example, the steady energy equation that we discussed and also solved in the exercises. For example, if we take here now the example for the central finite volume method, then we would have that the A capital W is the diffusion conductance D little w plus F little w half, and the AD is 
correspondingly the diffusion conductance at the east, that is then minus the convective mass flux at the east half. So that would be those, and for the south and north it is similar. Then we have the diffusion conductance ds plus fs half, all these are, this is the capital S at the node and the lowercase s for the phase values. And we have the an, that is then the dn minus <coughs> fn convective mass flux half. And these uh, terms then are the following. at that phase times the area of that phase divided by the distance in x between p and e. The fp, the convective mass flux at that phase, would be the rho times u times the area at that phase and the d north is then corresponding to the, diffuse, the Diffusion coefficient at the north, the area at the north, divided by the distance between the center node P and the northern neighbor N. The convective mass flux at the northern phase is then uh, corresponding to the rho V times the area at the north. And the corresponding coefficients for the other uh, phases, that's quite similar. The coefficient that is lacking is the center <coughs> coefficient, that is in our case now the AP tilde, but that is just, as we have learned, the sum over the neighbors and we sum over the neighboring coefficients. We subtract the SP, that is the um, coefficient coming from the source term discretization, and uh, our teaching assistant Sondre Alden uh, always reminds you to write down what these are even if they are zero. So if, if we have no source term then the SU is zero and the SP is zero. But we might have source terms and then they are of course relevant. So then we have this and we have more of that. We have also here a contribution coming from the mass flow rate over the boundary of the control volume which is then in our case the Fe, you see that here very nicely, minus the Fw plus the F north minus the F south. If the continuity equation is fulfilled, then those are zero. But when we, in the process of the computation, when we solve them, this equation, the transport equation with the Navier-Stokes equations, this is in general not the case. So we have then included to be sure. So in the end we see that we have done everything clear. The only thing that is lacking is how to discretize the time derivative. And then we just note that we can write the equation, the discretized uh, equation 3, where we have semi-discretized, because the time derivative is not yet discretized. So then this equation can be written as That is then four. That we have the time derivative of phi p is equal to uh, a residual that is related to a p of phi. And if we look at that, what it is? Now we are then assuming that the density indeed is constant. So then we can just divide by that and by the volume of the cell, so we get 1 over rho times the volume of the cell, and then we get 
the contributions that are left. So we bring that on the right hand side, that is the minus a tilde t times phi t, and then plus the sum over the neighboring coefficients a and b phi and b, and the uniform part of the source term. So that is then what we get from there, and that is then the bracket is then closed here. So that is then our residual that we get here. Just taking the equation 3 and isolating the, the, the phi p dt, and then we get this. Now we have to decide on the time discretization. We have, because what we have now here, the equation um, um, 4, that is simply a system of ODEs, when we think we do that in every cell, then we have then in the end a system of ordinary differential equations in time. So then we have to decide how we do the time discretization, and then we use any of the methods that we have learned when we discuss the time discretization in chapter 7. However, here, as the title of the chapter says, we want to focus on implicit methods. So then we choose an implicit time discretization. We should we also choose an explicit one, but here we want to do an implicit, take an implicit one because that, there we are more free in the choice of the time step. Especially, say, we have here an unsteady problem, so we have to respect what is happening, but nevertheless, if we have an implicit method, we have just to focus on accuracy and not on stability. So that is the advantage, but the disadvantage is we have to do more work because we have to solve systems of equations. Well, that is a technical problem, which I don't know if I can do that. Well, um, I'm sorry, uh, some of you have to test uh, test it with that, because uh, I'm not used to it, so uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, then we choose an implicit method. So, Choose a time discretization. Um, of chapter <coughs> seven. So here uh, we focus on implicit methods and choose the implicit Euler method. So if we would do it a little better, we would uh, choose then the backward differentiation formula. That would be then uh, have high order accuracy but then we would have to store one uh, time level more. Here we only need to store the old time level and the new time level that we compute. So then it would be like that, that we discretize the equation 4 by simply taking the value at the new time level that we want to compute minus the old value that we have from the previous time level n, the old time level that we know, and the right hand side that is the residual we take at phi n plus 1. So that is then the discretization in time. And if we use now uh, what we have here, we can write that down. And if we use that then, then we get the following. can use 
use it here or you can just also take it in the form three. So using five, um, if we use that, it's actually easier to use it directly in in four or three. Then we get the following. So if we use it in uh, in three, then we have it just in the form that we are used to. Then we have the density times the time derivative, phi p n plus one minus phi n. So that is now the discretized time derivative times the volume of the cell p plus the coefficients a p tilde times our unknown at p. And now the important thing is now these values are all at the new time level. <coughs> and on the right hand side we have then the sum over the neighbors with the neighbors neighboring coefficients and the unknowns at the neighbors at the new time level. That is now important plus the ununiform part of the source term. So that is what we get. And this we can again express as in the form with the coefficients. Yes? Is there a reason that you don't write like um, the P sign in the description of the density around the like n plus 1 minus phi and... It's just a missing. Thank you. It's just a missing. Thank you. It's not just a... Thank you. Okay. So then that can be expressed as in the following way and that is then the usual way uh, in where we use the coefficients and now you see the reason why we use uh, the AP tilde now we can indeed use the AP coefficient phi P and that is then at the new time level and that is equal to the sum over the neighbors, the neighboring coefficients, and we have here then the phi at the neighbors at the new time level. So we simply, as you uh, will see, that we, what we do here is we see here that we have here the AP coefficient, so we have rho VP divided by delta T. And then this part here is known, we get that on the right hand side. And then we have here also an AP tilde coefficient. They together, together with this coefficient here, they will be then the AP coefficient. And these are already uh, okay, we have just put them here. And now we have then moved this part on the right hand side and then we call the coefficient there AP0 times the unknown at, at this node P at the old time level plus the uniform part of the source term. And in here the A and B are defined as in equation 3 that we discussed before. And the coefficients that are now coming in addition that are the AP0 and the AP. So the AP0 is from what we just discussed is then the rho density, volume of the cell P divided by the time step delta T. So if we would write out that what this is in our case for the 2D problem, assuming then that the delta Z is 1, we get for our Cartesian um, grid for the volume of that cell delta X delta Y. Remember delta Z was 1 divided by delta T. And the AP coefficient is what we also already discussed, 
that is the original coefficient that we have also for the steady um, conservation law, AP tilde. And now we get in addition, actually this one here, the AP zero coefficient. So now you see the reason why we have this notation. And then we end up with just the same uh, uh, form as we had for the steady equation. The difference is that we have here now a little different uh, uniform source term which we can define as SU tilde. Otherwise, it is just the same as we had for the steady case. So that means our equation 6 can be solved as uh, the corresponding equation for uh, steady conservation laws. the f-coefficients and thereby the coefficients uh, will change. So therefore we have to do this in each time step. of course uh, more work than just solely for steady state. So for each time step. in time has to be solved. Okay. When doing this, so then uh, essentially then we know how to do it. Of course then it boils down to a system of uh, uh, linear equations and then that we solve by our favorite method. What we trained was the alternating line Gauss-Seidel method, but we could use other, say, more powerful methods like the multiple method. When solving the, uh, the unsteady incompressible, Navier Stokes equations, um, the momentum equations in our case it would be the x and y momentum equations. Can be solved as um, let's see. Uh, yeah, they can be solved as a conservation law. That is the point. So as equation one. So we can then, as we discussed already, we can consider that also then as a conservation law, where the pressure um, force on the right hand side would be a part of the source term. And the volume force, if, if we have it. For the pressure velocity coupling, we can. 
can use a simple approximation as we did for steady flow. So if we have that, then we can solve unsteady problems. So you see the form formalism is uh, very sim similar to steady flow. The main difference is that we have now additional coefficients from the time discretization, this here. But otherwise it's very similar. And of course the main difference is that we have to do that now in each time step. So that was uh, solving unsteady heat and fluid flow problems. Now we want to look into alternatives to simple. So that is the pressure coupling that we have used. It is a very useful one. However, we should also be aware of the alternatives, which might be and usually are more efficient. The first one is called simplex. And um, that is simple uh, consistent. And the uh, motivation of that has been that the weakness of a simple algorithm is due to the inconsistency in when we derive it. When we derive it, we neglect the contributions from the neighbors. <coughs> Focus on the relation between the velocity um, perturbation, uh, the velocity uh, correction, and the pressure correction, so that we can get that more easily. So that is the weakness of simple. That is due to the inconsistency of neglecting of neglecting the uh, terms sum over the neighbors, neighboring coefficients, and then we have the uh, velocity corrections at the neighbors. So when, when we did the derivation, that was the thing that led to the simple approximation. And now we remember what we did. We, when we do it correctly, when we would do it correctly then, we would have the following. We would have the uh, center coefficient, now we use this notation with the indices. We have, we have the velocity perturbation at uh, the location. We are on the staggered grid, of course, here. And then we have this term that is neglected. We, in, we include that now for the correct formulation. So then we have these neighboring coefficients, a and b, times the velocity corrections at these neighbors. Then we have the pressure force acting in the x-direction that is then given by Pij prime, so it's the, velocity, the pressure correction at that, that is the node on the right, pressure at the node on the right, pressure correction on the node on the right, that is a capital J here, and correspondingly we have then the Pi minus 1J prime, that is the western neighbor, times the area. So then this is the 
pressure force. And this term, that is the, the problem term here, that is uh, neglected by, uh, by simple. So this term here. And we have a similar inconsistency for the y-momentum equation. There, a similar term is neglected. So, if we continue our argument, so the weakness of simple is due to inconsistent neglecting this term. Um, in this equation 7a, that here, in this equation here, and um, due to a similar uh, inconsistency similar inconsistency um, of neglecting that is the term sum over the neighbors the neighboring coefficients and the, now the velocity perturbation here we have it in the x direction now here it's in the y direction and that is then the following uh, equation, that is 7b. There we have then our, we'll have another location then, which is capital I, lowercase j, the velocity perturbation at that point. And then we have the neighboring coefficients, the neighbors, the neighboring coefficients, and the velocity perturbations in the y direction at these. Um, neighbors. Then we have the pressure force now in the y direction from the velocity, from pressure perturbation that is now P capital I J prime minus P I capital J minus one prime times the area that we have at uh, that uh, phase. So that is then we get and here the critical term that is neglected by simple is this term. Okay. So these terms are the ones that are causing problems. So and the idea of simple, the consistent simple is to approximate these terms here now and to approximate them by the value at the center node. So instead of neglecting them, we approximate them by the value at the center node. That is the idea. So then we have still an approximation, but it is consistent. So that is then the idea that we shall pursue after the break. But before we go into the break, I have an important uh, question to those of you who took uh, TP4280, Introduction to CFD and to who got grade A or B and who are interested to be teaching assistant on that course. So if you fall under that category, if you have taken the course introduction to CFD in the spring, got A or B, please apply for uh, getting teaching assistant. And already and now I would like to announce for those of you getting in this course A or B to apply to get teaching assistant next year. Thank you.